Welcome to World Shared Practices Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're here again today with Dr. Peter Lawson, who is Chair of the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the Toronto Sick Children's Hospital and Professor of Anesthesia at the University of Toronto. In our previous World Shared Practices Forum, we've been discussing several aspects related to the care of the child in shock. Dr. Mark Peters from the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London spoke to us about the evidence and development of guidelines for the care of the child in shock. And more recently, Dr. Randolph also discussed the evidence basis for the development of guidelines. And then finally, last month, Professor Catherine Maitland spoke to us about her research on fluid resuscitation of children with malaria in East Africa and uh, her findings in the so-called FEAST study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. We're fortunate to have with us today Dr. Peter Lawson. And the goal of today's talk is to ask Dr. Lawson how he puts this all together. How does he think about the existing evidence, the guidelines, and his personal experience? And in particular, we begin the discussion talking about the presentation of a child who's developing inadequate tissue perfusion. We begin the discussion by examining the relationship between oxygen delivery as plotted on the x-axis here and oxygen consumption as plotted on the y-axis. And we're talking about the context where oxygen delivery is falling and the patient's developing inadequate tissue perfusion. And I asked Dr. Lawson, what is he looking for at this time? And how is he trying to identify and indeed prevent the development of the anaerobic threshold? What physical exam findings, what physiologic features, and what biomarkers does Dr. Lawson follow in this context? We turn now to Dr. Lawson. Well, thank you, Jeff, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I wonder if I could ask you here at this critical point, uh, you know, as we've all been there, it's uh, the middle of the night, and you're staring at this patient, and you know that they're becoming progressively more ill. What are you looking at? Mixed venous sat? Um, are you interested in looking at B-type natriuretic uh, peptide, uh, troponins? What kind of biomarkers are you looking at? And, and of course, your physical exam, I've heard you say this several times, but you know, you're standing at the foot of the bed, you're looking at the monitor, then you're doing an exam. Take me through what you're thinking here. What I'm thinking is, where are we on this curve? And I want to be able to assess this patient be, before we reach this critical point. I don't want us to get to this point and then find that there's a sudden unraveling. Uh, and in many respects, the, the appearance of a low mixed venous oxygen saturation or of a lactic acidosis, we've missed the boat a little bit. We're, then we're trying to play catch up uh, to an evolving clinical picture. Unfortunately, we don't have really good early warning systems in critical care that will tell us where we are in this balance between supply and demand. I think the clinical features of a child still remain one of the most important assessments. And there are, I think, key features. One is loss of variability of a hemodynamic state is important to appreciate. So often the child will have tachycardia, often a variable tachycardic response depending on the stimulation and, and underlying diagnosis. But when they get to a point where they lose that variability, then you need to be well aware that this is a critical situation and that patient may be getting to a point where they have no reserve left and will rapidly deteriorate. So they rapidly reach this point and then deteriorate uh, and result in adequate, inadequate systemic oxygen delivery. So what clinical features do I look for in a child? Well, let's take the child who presents to you who's, bre who's breathing spontaneously. Uh, for obviously, their conscious state how interactive they are with their environment and the people around them. And, and a child who is uh, non-responsive and lethargic clearly is a, a, a very important warning sign that cardiac output is marginal. On the other hand, a child who is fretful, who is, doesn't want to be handled or is uh, clinging to their parents or their caregivers, that also can be an indication that that child is in a critical state. And it may not be because they're scared or because of the strange environment. So appreciating, appreciating any sort of change in their underlying uh, conscious level and interaction is important. Asking the parents is important. Is this normal? Is this what you would expect? So I think that's, that's one. I place a lot of emphasis on their 
peripheral examination. So the first thing I do when I examine a child who may have a low output state is to feel their peripheral pulses. I feel that particularly they're in their lower extremity. Um, absence of that pulse is clearly uh, a very important sign. On the other hand, a pulse that is thready, uh, that doesn't have a very rapid upstroke, and obviously tachycardic, is, a, is an important indication to me that you need to pay attention to uh, the oxygen delivering cardiac output in that circumstance. The color, the perfusion of uh, extremities is also important. We all know that one of the defense mechanisms of a low output state is to try and centralize your blood volume, is to uh, develop peripheral vasoconstriction. Well, that response is quite variable in children, because particularly newborns and infants, because of the maturational status and, and the development of adrenoreceptors in particular. So that may be a delayed finding. And any child who has got thready pulses, cool extremities, and particularly mottled appearance, should immediately raise a flag that this output is critical. And we're perhaps moving further along this line towards that critical point. The respiratory status of that child is also critical. So uh, a child who is tachypnic, grunting, obviously showing increased work of breathing, I think to all of us is a very uh, obvious indicator that there is that child's got an increased work of breathing and may reflect that their cardiac output is limited. It's the child who presents with progressive tachypnea that may be missed. So the child who has a normal respiratory rate that's increasing slowly from the 20s to the mid-20s to the 30s, mid-30s, that's often a subtle change. It's often not captured very well or appreciated. And yet that will be the first sign that their uh, oxygen requirements are elevated and that you may not, be, uh, may not be meeting the balance of supply and demand. Careful assessment is absolutely critical. One of the first things we often do in circumstances of the child with, uh, we suspect, may have a low output state is turn to our monitors. Monitoring and biochemical markers are clearly very important, but a very focused clinical examination with attention to detail is often the most important initial step. In fact, it is the most important initial step. There was a Canadian intensivist by the name of Neil Finer, and he used to say, a good intensivist is one who is there. And you're making the point that it's a meticulous serial exam over time to assess uh, the patient in a dynamic situation. I wonder if I could ask our colleagues around the world, could you identify the city and country where you're located? And could you tell us what kind of monitoring, whether invasive, for example, CVP, arterial blood pressure, or non-invasive, for example, non-invasive blood pressure, are you employing in a child with low cardiac output state in your intensive care unit? I wonder if I could take you now into the monitoring phase. And so here we are, and I'm asking myself, uh, what am I going to put in for monitoring? And 25 years ago, you and I would have been saying, let's put in a PA catheter. But right heart catheters uh, aren't commonly used nowadays, and we know from the literature that the average clinician doesn't appear to utilize the data very well. Um, in our own practice, we have, I think, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, perhaps along with the River Study, uh, become um, increasingly reliant on placing a right-sided um, internal jugular catheter at the SVC-RA junction and measuring uh, mixed venous saturation from there. But I wonder, what is your practice on, on intravascular monitoring? How often are you sampling? What are you looking for, again, uh, in terms of the biomarkers? Well, my first approach is to look at non-invasive monitoring. The attempts to place invasive monitoring, such as a central venous uh, line or even gaining arterial access, may be that stress that will tip the patient over, that will take them from this sort of part of the curve to one where they completely uh, develop a, uh, an imbalance between their supply-demand ratio. So simply placing the lines made to get information is important in some circumstances, but do it in a, in a very calculated and thoughtful way. 
heart rate, ECG, pulse oximetry, standard measurement, I think, in every patient. I think there are other non-invasive ways in which to get uh, information. In the uh, current era of um, improved optical techniques, non-invasive methodology using near-infrared near spectroscopy, uh, I think has a real role here. It's a way in which you can look at oxygen delivery that's perfusion and particularly pulse independent. Cerebral oxygen saturation gives you an indication as to oxygen de delivery to a very important organ. But you can place these uh, sensors uh, in the, uh, on the abdomen or uh, to get some, some assessment of somatic blood flow as well and perhaps the difference between cerebral and somatic oxygen delivery. That perhaps may give you some indication, but one of the things I, I, I found very advantageous is to be able to use non-invasive monitoring with near-infrared to give me an idea as to the adequacy of oxygen delivery. And I've used it in circumstances where patients may not have very good peripheral pulses. You may not be able to place an arterial line. You know that they're uh, in significant respiratory distress, and you're trying to get the monitoring that you need to guide your therapy as a step to, before you can actually achieve that, non-invasive monitoring is helpful. I think end tidal CO2 as well is also a very important monitor and I think in many respects um, uh, has replaced other means by which we can assess pulmonary blood flow. So, uh, and it's possible with uh, current non-invasive strategies to place uh, uh, end tidal a small catheter into the, the nostril to measure end tidal CO2. Once again, it's not an absolute number. Use it as a trend, use it as a guideline, and uh, it will help you prepare for the next stage. So I think those are important. Uh, notice I didn't mention non-invasive blood pressure. I think that they are difficult numbers to interpret in a child who's in a very low output state, who's defending their circulation, and you may have a a recording that shows you with an adequate systolic blood pressure, but it may not reflect at all the severity of that uh, low output state and the impending potential disaster that's about to occur when this imbalance arrives. So uh, be cautious not to be lulled into or assume that everything is okay because you have a non-invasive blood pressure that's normal. That child is defending the circulation until a critical event occurs. So using non-invasive techniques, I think, has a real role to play. They're also less expensive, mm -hmm. but they also give you, I think, some chance to uh, continue your assessment knowing that there is an adequate ventilation, knowing that there is an adequate oxygen delivery. I wonder if we could move now to the um, case of an intubated patient who's Again, uh, progressively acidotic oxygen extraction is rising, uh, pH is falling, uh, lactic acidosis, etc. Um, and um, our practice also has evolved uh, where I think we're relying a lot more on capnography, as you noted, uh, to look for not, not just the, the trend, but also the amplitude changes with interventions. Did the child respond to a bolus? Um, but I wonder if I could press you a little more. So it's, it's the intubated patient who has central lines. Um, what are you going to put in uh, for both access and monitoring, and what biomarkers are you looking for? Before we hear from Dr. Lawson, we'd like to ask the audience the same question. Could you identify the city and country where you're located, and could you tell us, in an intubated, mechanically ventilated patient with indwelling central lines, what kind of monitoring are you following, including invasive monitoring, non-invasive monitoring, and serum biomarkers? How often are you trending these parameters? So the biomarkers that I will primarily look for are late warning signs. Unfortunately, that's, we have to appreciate that they are late warning signs. But it's uh, evidence of inadequate oxygen utilization. And it's a rising lactate and a fall in your mixed venous oxygen saturation. I think both of those can be readily measured and they can be tracked over time to see what the trend is and the response to therapy. Now, I know it's a dynamic situation and contexts are different, uh, 
but how often are you monitoring this? And I don't want to hold you to one fixed uh, time, but I'm trying to get a sense. Um, every hour, every two hours, every four hours, or does it simply depend on what you think is the trajectory of the patient? Largely depends on the trajectory of the patient, on your assessment, and also on the underlying di diagnosis and where you perceive the evolution of their clinical picture. I think a lactate every hour in re and measuring response to treatment is appropriate. At least, at least in that critical phase when you are, have made the diagnosis of low output state and now are, are progressing towards a management plan, just to make sure that there is uh, a biochemical marker of a response to the therapy. Now, that may not be possible to do in, in all laboratories, but I do believe that that is a valuable marker. Not so much the absolute lactate, but it's the rate of change of lactate. And a rate of change of lactate of more than three millimoles per liter per hour has been demonstrated at least in a cardiac population, pediatric cardiac population, as an index of um, severe low output state and has been demonstrated to be associated with adverse outcome. So the rate of changes is, is I think, more important than the absolute number. Mixed venous oxygen saturation uh, has a, a role, uh, certainly, and I would measure that um, every time I measured a blood gas. And it may be that you're measuring that every two to four hours, uh, and it's not the continuous variable that you would otherwise perhaps like to monitor therapy. Certainly there are, not, there are invasive catheters that will allow you to continuously measure uh, venous oxygen saturation. I'm not convinced that they've found a role in terms of targeting therapy. Once again, the trend over time I think is very important and I don't think it's something that needs to be measured uh, on a uh, regular fashion when compared to a biochemical marker like lactate. And where would you be measuring the mixed venous uh, from? Does it matter? Uh, can it be a low line? Ideally, should it be a line at the SVC RA junction, which most people seem to recommend? Um, you seem to have answered the question about a PA catheter and floating it out for continuous uh, mixed venous oxygen saturation monitoring, which, um, as you've just noted, uh, is probably um, not necessary uh, or perhaps not worth uh, mm. the, the uh, potential harm to the patient. But where ideally are you placing a line to follow mixed venous saturation? Well, the true definition is still uh, uh, saturation drawn from the main pulmonary artery. Uh, but for the reasons you mentioned, it's usually not possible to have that catheter placed in a child in a low output state unless it's placed uh, particularly in infants and younger children, unless that catheter is placed, say, in the catheterization laboratory under imaging. So I would look for the position of that catheter to be at the right atrial SVC junction. Now, I understand that there may be intracardiac shunts that will contribute to a false reading there. It may be falsely elevated or uh, falsely low. But once again, the absolute number isn't what is targeting, is, is driving therapy. It is the trend in that number over time. And I think be, provided you're using that monitoring as a trend in response to your therapy, then you can also measure femoral venous or uh, IVC saturations as well, acknowledging that there will be a different source of venous return, often from, uh, obviously from the gut and from splanchnic organs who may have a very low oxygen saturation because of their, uh, the, the underlying pathology. But having said that, trending them over time may also give you some evidence that uh, there's been a response to your therapy or lack of response to your therapy. And could I push you a little more? Are you looking for any other biomarkers um, in this phase? Are you following BNP? Are you following troponin? I'm not following that. I think there's good evidence that BMP may give you some uh, assistance in targeting uh, volume replacement and myocardial function. Same with troponin. Uh, 
but in as, a, as a marker of are we able to meet demand with an adequate cardiac output and oxygen delivery, I'm not using those in general as an indicator of that, re that relationship. I wonder if we could uh, now ask and turn to you, um, because we want to make this an exchange of ideas. So if I could ask you to pause and um, tell us what city you're in, and if you could tell us your practice. Now, Dr. Lawson's made the point, and I think the critical point that we would all agree, that the key thing is for the physician to be doing a frequent and careful examination of the perfusion uh, and the entire patient, and that there's nothing more important than that step in the assessment. But if we move beyond that, could I ask you this? In your center, if you're placing an intravascular line, where do you place the line, um, and what kind of biomarkers are you looking for? Uh, so we'll pause now and um, look for your response. Uh, Dr. Lawson, I wonder now if we could talk uh, about your practice and what you use to support cardiac output with terms of vasoactive agents. Um, as you well know, there's been some recent uh, uh, data from the adult literature saying that dopamine in an elderly population was pro-arrhythmogenic and at least in the subset analysis in cardiogenic shock indeed had a worse outcome when compared with norepinephrine. Uh, there's been some recent recommendations from the Society of Critical Care Medicine's uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign about promoting the use of, of norepinephrine uh, in septic shock, for, for instance. The American Heart Association is, um, also has recent recommendations uh, cautioning against the use of dopamine, again, in the elderly population. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about catecholamines, but also calcium sensitizers. If you use them, what do you prefer? Um, and why, and, um, and your thoughts about vasopressin. Thank you. You've raised some very important points here, Jeff, and I do not want to be dogmatic or uh, emphatic in what I say. I have used dopamine and epinephrine as primary inotropic agents in children with cardiac disease following cardiac surgery, and even those with acquired cardiac disease very effectively. And I will not say that one is better than the other. However, you need to use these drugs in their appropriate way, understanding what their uh, limitations are. So there is variable practice. And there is certainly a lot of dogma. And I think we need to challenge dogma. I think the statements that are coming out from Society for Critical Care Medicine and other bodies like the American Heart Association are based on adult data. It's not relevant to our patients. But once again, we're left in this situation where we will follow along and we'll be pulled along by the wealth of data that may be out there or the interpretation of that in the adult population. We need to do a much better job at collecting information at the bedside. And that includes not only the hemodynamic changes beat to beat, real time and not periodic data, but also in conjunction with the drugs that we are using so that we can actually see what their effect is rather than relying on irrelevant patient populations in many respects. That's, that's my first point. I think the other aspects about the drugs you choose depend on uh, the patient and understanding uh, variable patient response. I think we've all had patients who have had catecholamine resistance shock we don't quite understand what that circumstance is, but it may be related to uh, adrenal receptor polymorphism, down regulation of receptors. And I think if there's a target for further investigation in the years to come, it will be trying to take the phenotype of catecholamine resistant shock or low output state and measure that against a specific genotype and try and understand if there are specific polymorphisms that contribute to that state. We also need to appreciate the consequences of the drugs that we use. They're not without complications. Arrhythmias in particular. Um, the potential for impaired diastolic function, particularly at high doses of inotropic agents. And that reflects impairment to calcium homeostasis. 
patients in a low output state, particularly if it's related to um, impaired myocardial function, may also have uh, the potential for ischemia and reperfusion injury to that myocardium. And once again, the impaired calcium homeostasis may be exaggerated in that patient population. So understanding the consequences is very important. But we need data. Having said all of that, I think there are three ways to approach the drugs to enhance output from the heart to try and meet metabolic demand, low cardiac output. The first are drugs that through cyclic AMP mediated mechanisms increase intracellular calcium. And that may be through adrenergic receptor stimulation, or it may be through phosphodiesterase uh, type 3 inhibition of uh, cyclic AMP breakdown. The second subgroup of drugs now available are non-cyclic AMP dependent and they increase calcium sensitization and, and the drug you mentioned was levosimendin. And then the third category are neuro, neurohumoral interactions where vasopressin is one example and perhaps this is where the steroid question also comes into play. I wonder if I could now um, turn to the audience and ask again if you could share with, with us how you approach these issues. If you could first tell us what city you're in, and again, what is your uh, first line, second and third line inotropic agents to support the failing myocardium? You already raised the discussion about dopamine versus norepinephrine in the adult literature, and uh, in particular, this article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, comparing dopamine and norepinephrine in the treatment of shock. Looking at their uh, analysis and hazard ratio, I think it's possible to conclude in this adult study that norepinephrine appears to have a mortality benefit, particularly in cardiogenic shock. But once again, this is a relatively small subset of patients that had cardiogenic shock. They were all ischemic cardiomyopathies or ischemia-related disease, and not relevant to the primary um, reasons we see for myocardial failure in children with shock. I'm not discounting this data, and norepinephrine does have a role to play in pediatric patients who are in shock. Whether it should be a drug that replaces dopamine, however, I don't think there's any data to support that. Nor norepinephrine's primary effect is on the peripheral circulation and will increase afterload through basis constriction. It has some weak inotropic properties and no conotropic properties. So in a circumstance where you need to enhance myocardial perfusion through increasing coronary perfusion pressure, then I think there is a real role for norepinephrine. We mentioned some of those patients earlier, such as those with restrictive cardiomyopathy and diastolic dysfunction, and patients who are shocked with a very low systemic vascular resistance they may well benefit from having a drug that augments diastolic pressure and thereby coronary and cerebral perfusion pressure. I don't think that in of itself is sufficient to say it is a better drug than dopamine in children. Dopamine has a much greater conotropic effect, but it is also a very strong inotrope and a dose-dependent vasopressor. So in my practice, I will frequently use dopamine as my first line drug, starting at three to five micrograms per kilogram per minute, and will take and, and will increase infusion up to around 10 mics per kilo per minute, but no further. If I am uh, primarily no further because of my concern for dysrhythmias and the effect that the tachycardia will have on oxygen demand, myocardial oxygen demand. So once again, I think it's a, it's a very good drug in the early phase to try and augment inotropy to increase output. But I would not continue to increase the dose of this drug to try and achieve a desired effect because the adverse consequences of, that, of dopamine will start to come into play. So the data from adults may not be immediately relevant to pediatric patients. I don't want to discard it, however.
but there's also some other in interesting data about dopamine and its, uh, the potential detrimental effects of dopamine uh, that comes from uh, the group uh, at Sick Kids in Toronto. Now, this is a study of the effects of dopamine on hemodynamic status and oxygen transport in neonates after the Nord procedure. So immediately we've got other variables in here with uh, an immature myocardium uh, and a procedure on bypass that will clearly incite an inflammatory response and there are considerable changes in the loading conditions on the myocardium. This was also a relatively small population of patients and it's not possible to draw general conclusions perhaps. However, it does illustrate the, uh, one of the concerns regarding dopamine and if you look at this first panel here, you can see, which is measuring oxygen consumption with dopamine on and then at termination. And there was, at the time that dopamine was terminated, there was a significant decrease in expired um, VO2. At the same time as the dopamine was terminated, there was also a significant decrease in heart rate and there was also a significant decrease in the rate pressure product. Now the rate pressure product may be an indicator of myocardial oxygen demand. But I think the point here is that there is a dose related response of dopamine to, to cause tachycardia. The tachycardia in of itself can be detrimental in terms of myocardial oxygen demand. So simply continuing to increase the dose of dopamine to a targeted response may result in an adverse effect. So dopamine in my practice is often the first line drug. I'll use it to five, perhaps 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And if I haven't seen the hemodynamic response at that point, I will add in a second inotrope. Now another way to think about this is to not use dopamine at all and to use an, an agent like epinephrine. And I think epinephrine has very important characteristics that are of a benefit in patients who have uh, poor myocardial function, so they need an inotrope, but they also have elevated afterload because the beta effects of epinephrine and can have some vasodilatory properties here, particularly at low dose, that may be of benefit. So you get an inotropic effect as well as a fall in afterload, um, which may improve myocardial function, stroke volume, and myocardial oxygen um, energy requirements. So I think the epinephrine is uh, an, an excellent drug and using it as a first line in a patient who is hypotensive with low cardiac output state makes sense. One of the discussions that comes frequently is which of these drugs is more likely to incite a tachycardia and there's no real data to support one contention over another and is another area that we need to really collect data to really, in a continuous fashion, to understand the effect of these drugs. The value of both of these drugs is that they are titratable. So that if you're starting the drug and as you increase it, you're inducing a tachycardia or, an un, or a side effect that is um, not desired, you can reduce it, discontinue it, or reduce the dose and add another drug in. So it gives you flexibility. Once again, you're targeting what you perceive to be the underlying problems in terms of the cardiac output and how you may in fact uh, augment myocardial function to meet oxygen delivery. I would also make the point that there is no value in escalating an inotrope to make a heart squeeze harder that's already squeezing quite well. And there are many circumstances where systolic function is actually quite well preserved. And making the heart squeeze harder and faster to increase cardiac output is only going to have a detrimental effect on myocardial oxygen demand and uh, energy balance. Once again, be targeted in the way in which you approach these drugs. So that's very interesting to hear your thoughts about the traditional catecholamines. Um, could we talk about um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, milrinone, and of course, uh, probably one of the few elegant studies in the literature that guides us. Um, how do you think about that? 
The Primer Core study that you're referring to was a landmark study, in my mind, because it was a successful multi-institutional study in critical care. It gave us a roadmap for doing these types of studies, uh, particularly in patients with cardiac disease. And it was the first one of its, of its kind. Now, the Primer Core study is frequently cited as indicating the value of milrinone to enhance cardiac output. Remember that these were patients after cardiac surgery. They were infants. They had a select diagnosis. Uh, so it's hard to extrapolate across, uh, it's hard to extrapolate uniformly across all patients to say that milrinone is of value uh, and benefit. But you can see in this uh, graphic here that the higher dose of milrinone was associated with a uh, lower relative risk for uh, low output state. Now, it's also important to remember that the, primarily, the primary definition for low cardiac output state was based on clinical and biochemical markers. There was no measurement of cardiac output. But having said that, in this patient population, after cardiac surgery, there certainly appeared to be a benefit in the higher dose of milrinone in terms of perfusion and output. But as I noted, it's not possible, I think, to extrapolate this information across all patient categories, and yet that, I think, has tended to be one of the assumptions. And I think this is a drug that still needs to be used with caution. To use milrinone in a targeted fashion, it is important we understand how this drug works. As a phosphodiesterase and type 3 inhibitor, it's going to increase intracellular calcium. That increase in intracellular calcium will have a positive inotropic effect, although that effect is weaker than epinephrine and dopamine, but may in fact also augment those effects. Unclear as to how much that occurs and how predictable that is, but it's a relatively weak inotrope. It's a systemic vasodilator, and therefore will reduce the afterload on the myocardium. And in patients who have systolic dysfunction and uh, particularly a volume-loaded heart, then there is, I think, clear benefit for a drug like milrinone because it will augment stroke volume and cardiac output without increasing myocardial oxygen demand. The question that often comes up is the luciotropic properties of drugs like this. In other words, their ability to um, augment relaxation of the heart. And I think this is something that's very hard to measure and we don't have a, uh, a way to do it at the bedside. The luciotropic properties occur because the increase in intracellular um, cyclic AMP augments the reuptake of calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is an active process. And by augmenting that reuptake, thereby augmenting relaxation. Now, that makes sense, but I'm not certain that is in fact what we see at the bedside. I think we have many patients who have abnormal muscle, uh, may have immature muscle with poorly developed sarcoplasmic reticulum, or even muscle that is uh, edematous uh, for whatever reason, and, it may be, and, and to assume that we are in effect augmenting diastolic function through enhanced relaxation, I think can be um, overstated. So it's a drug I used um, with some circumspect. A patient who has got low output state, high SVR, relatively preserved blood pressure, I think milrinone is a very good drug to use. But once again, remember, it's not as titratable as because of its volume distribution and half-life as epinephrine and dopamine. So longer effects. So if you start the drug, it's not necessarily easily to reverse the effect. I would also be very cautious using milrinone in patients who have a fixed stroke volume because of their restrictive cardiomyopathy or they've got inflow or outflow obstruction from the systemic ventricle. So using a drug that results in systemic vasodilation 
may in fact contribute to severe hypotension and with that hypoperfusion of the coronary circulation because the heart's just unable to increase their output to meet that change in afterload. So it needs to be used in, uh, cautiously in, in that regard as well. Perhaps more difficult are the, patient who, are the patients who have low cardiac output state and are hypotensive. I think there's little role for milrinone in my practice as a first-line drug for those patients. It's important to obtain a perfusion pressure first before then adding in a systemic vasodilator, particularly in the, if the patient's already got some fall in systemic vas vascular resistance related to, say, distributive shock. So once again, I think it's a targeted approach. I wonder if I could ask our colleagues around the world, could you identify the city and country where you're located? And could you tell us, are you using milrinone in the pediatric cardiac patient with low cardiac output state? If yes, is there a specific population in which you initiate this infusion? At what dose do you initiate it? How do you titrate it? The role of vasopressin in pediatric patients, I think, is still evolving. Uh, uh, to kids, it's a commonly used drug, particularly in patients following cardiac surgery, in a way to augment the effect of uh, adrenoreceptor agonists, um, but as a way to also balance systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. However, there is very limited data as to its benefit in pediatric vasodilatory shock. This is one study that came f out of Canada looking at just that question and concluded that low-dose vasopressin did not show beneficial effects, but there was a potential concerning increase towards mortality. I don't want to emphasize that last statement. I think the more important statement is that there did not appear to be any beneficial effects. In my practice, vasopressin has a role. A patient who has got um, significant endothelial dysfunction or is hypotensive um, from poor vascular tone then I think there is a role for vasopressin to increase tone and coronary perfusion. I also think there is data in both experimental uh, work as well as in adult patients that there can be vasopressin-mediated enhancement of um, adrenergic vasoconstriction. So I think, once again, it's a drug that I would not discard. It's a, a third-line drug, if you like, but I think there is the potential to add benefit to the existing therapy that you've started. Finally, levosimendin. I think the experience with this drug is still continuing and it's unclear as to whether it has a role in acute or chronic low output states. Intuitively, it is a drug that would seem to be closer to the ideal inotropic agent. It's cyclic AMP independent um, in terms of its action results in a conformational change in tro troponin C that increases the sensitivity of troponin C to intracellular calcium. It may improve contractility without increasing myocardial oxygen demand and also has uh, an additional benefit of ATP uh, sensitive potassium channel activation. However, clinical work to date has not really demonstrated a uh, discrete role for levosimendin in the patient with acute low cardiac output state. There may be a role for the patient who has a chronic low output state from cardiomyopathy, but then again, further work in that regard is necessary. Dr. Lawson, thank you for sharing um, your, your experience and your practice and your approach. This is the type of thing that, you know, colleagues around the world are always curious, uh, you know, you've been doing this for 25 years, you've accumulated a lot of experience, and yet there's often not an opportunity to find out you know, how you actually think about these issues. If you have any other comments or questions, uh, now's the uh, time to, um, to leave those for us so that we can um, share knowledge with, with each other around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.